Good morning. Good morning. Let's go ahead and begin class with prayer this morning. Gracious Father in heaven, we are so thankful to be able to come apart and study uh, together. We ask that your spirit will join us, empower us, enlighten us, transform us, and make us effective in sharing this message to the world to lighten it, that you will come soon. We pray in your holy name. Amen. Amen. So a few announcements I'm excited to make. Uh, first, I want to welcome our visitors here today. And if you are here visiting, today is our potluck weekend. We're going to have a ton of food. We always take too much home. So plan on staying and having potluck with us today. And, and for our regular members, be sure and uh, at the break, make our, our visitors feel welcome, welcome today. And then we are releasing a new sharing pamphlet today that is, just came out off the press. It's called The Book of Job and the Last Days, A Cosmic Overview seven truths to prepare for Christ's return. As you can see, it's pretty small. It's pretty short. Seven truths. And the seven truths are that the war is bigger than us. Number one. Number two, the enemy force is led by a supernatural deceiver. Three, pain, suffering, and death originate with Satan, but God gets blamed. Four, family and friends can be used to tempt and discourage. Five, Bible perfection is about unshakable love, trust, and loyalty to God, not about task performance or rule compliance. Six, health and wellness are not evidence of righteousness. And seven, the highest calling for each of us is to say what is right about God. These are the seven truths, and I think you'll find it's, it, it resets things in the, away from the imperial rules-oriented to the design healing uh, setting. And it also, throughout, will have links to various other resources. So in the introduction, there's a little QR code. If people want to know more about the Sanctuary Feast Days situation, they can go to our, our webinar there. Uh, and uh, over here, if they want to know more about... Uh, God's anger and wrath in the Old Testament. We have QR codes to the flood and how God used power in the Old Testament and what the first death and stuff is. And so it, uh, it has different uh, links to other resources to expand on some of this. So it's a good sharing track. These are available. If you're watching online sometime this weekend, the link will go up where you can begin ordering these and we ship those anywhere at the U.S. Postal address at no cost. And uh, we'll have a flip book that you can read this online too sometime this weekend. And then I have uh, taken up my position as medical director at Honey Lake Clinic in Florida, which is in Greenville, Florida. And this is a, we're very excited about this. This is a, a program, it's a thousand acre campus with uh, a holistic approach, specifically Christ-centered, and it is the only residential psychiatric Christian treatment center in the country. Excellent. And so we have a, uh, when I say Christian, it integrates the Christian principles. It deals with not just the best neurobiology and, and physiology elements, but the whole person care. People cannot have mental wellness if they are struggling with unresolved guilt or shame, or they're cheating on their spouse, or they have a porn addiction. Uh, they cannot have mental wellness. They, they need deliverance from these elements as well in order to find peace. And so this really brings in the best of both in a holistic approach. And we're wanting to expand this program, so we have a whole list of, of uh, opportunities for people who like to come down and be a part of our team, and they're, li they're listed in the notes. Various, basically licensed counselors of some kind, marriage family, licensed professional counselor, licensed clinical social worker, any of those types of people. If you're interested, then check out our notes, and you can e end our email, HR, which stands for HR, <laughs> Human Resources, <laughs> HR, <laughs> at honeylakeclinic.com, and you can get information about that. So we are doing lesson number nine, and I, and I would really like to build out a team of people who are like-minded, Christian, whole person care, and I know many of our, our listeners understand that because they already understand the design law elements. So we're doing Ephesians lesson nine. It says living wisely. How would you describe what it means to live wisely? Design law. I love that. Just, uh, living with the design law. I, I might, I might say it exactly the same way. You might say, take in cautiously what you, what comes to you, reason what comes in, comes to you, because you're confronted every single day with false and true, 
and to have a good reasoning ability is a part of what I consider living wisely. Okay, so living wisely is to, to think, reason, as it says in Hebrews 5.14, the mature, developed by practice, the ability to discern right from wrong. But how do they develop that? What is the basis? What is the standard? What is the measuring stick? What are the tools we use to be able to tell, is this true or is this not true? How do we know? Do we look for somebody else? Do we look for a rule, a list? 28 set of fundamental beliefs. Somebody, somebody's thought out for us. Somebody with a better degree. Or do we develop that skill and then the foundations are design law. How reality. And so for me, wisdom means to understand and live in harmony with objective reality. In harmony with the laws God built reality to operate upon. That's wise. And when you know those, then that gives you the ability to show. Oh no, they said that it's legal to smoke marijuana. Therefore, there must be anything wrong with it because it's legal now. That's not wisdom. Wisdom is humans can make things legal. They can't make things healthy if they're not healthy. That's design law. So Jesus taught this, what, this idea of living in harmony with reality when he said in Matthew 7, 24, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine puts them into pra and puts them into practice is like a wise man who, build, who built his house on the rock. Jesus is saying the wise understand God, his character, methods, principles, the design laws, how reality works, and puts them into practice. <laughs> Builds their house upon the things that don't collapse, that don't shift, that don't change. Jesus did not say, the wise man is the one who accepts my vicarious legal payment in his behalf and gets declared to be righteous uh, even though he remains unrighteous. He did not say that. He puts into practice and builds. Why is it foolishness to build one's life on a penal legal system of theology? Why is that foolishness? And I'm calling it foolishness. Shifting sands. Shifting sands. The, the rules change, don't they? Yes. Yeah. Have you ever... Ha, pardon. Let, let, let me follow up on that, that point for a minute, and then and I want to hear this. But it, the rules change. Have you ever, as an Adventist, traveled around the world and found there are different Sabbath rules around the world? Yes. The rules change. But did gravity change? The law of respiration change? The laws of health change? No, God's laws don't change. Rules change, yes. And it doesn't save you because uh, it's, a, it, because it's a false concept and you think it's going to save you. At the end, we're told people will turn on their ministers because the ministers told them this will save you and it didn't. Oh, I really like that. So picking up on what you said, the way I, I would expand or say that would be it's foolishness because it's fantasy. It's not true. It's a system of made up make believe. Mm -hmm. It's not how reality works. And if you have security on make-believe, then you're not prepared for reality. Yes? I was just going to say that also having a, a belief or religion doesn't necessarily change you. It's only the heart change. And once you start actually understanding design law and things like that, you can go to church all your life mm -hmm. and not have a heart change. Yeah. 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 So, so, right. so can I offer a friendly amendment? <laughs> it doesn't change you in positive ways. Okay, But if we have the other one, aren't we also being changed, but not in the way we want to be changed? Uh, th were the Pharisees, by, by their rules and systems, being hardened and changed and, 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 and made, made more, you know, and Pharaoh, when he would not accept the truth, he was also being changed by that. So we're, we're being changed, but what, I think what you meant was we're not being changed or transformed into God's ideal for us. We're not being saved or healed. You're just kind of going through the motions <clears throat> yes, exactly. of life, but you're not really enjoying it. So let's examine more wisdom scripture, because I'm making a point now. Wisdom is living in harmony with reality, which is God's laws that he built, reality, design law. And I'm going to go through wisdom scriptures. And I want you to see, as we go through these, we're going to go through a bunch of them, if in fact what you observe is exactly what I said that the wisdom scriptures are all about living in harmony with reality. There's nothing penal legal going on. So let's look at the first set. Proverbs 12, 15. The way of a fool seems right to him, but a wise man listens to advice. A wise son heeds his father's instructions, but a mocker does not listen to rebuke. The wise in heart accepts commands, but a chattering fool comes to ruin. Now these are all basically saying the same underlying process here, aren't they? And so what is being described? 
What does it mean to listen to advice, heed instructions, accept commands? Does that mean mindless, thoughtless, blind obedience, simply doing what somebody else is telling you to do? Is that what it means? No. So what is the wisdom? What is the wisdom here? It is acknowledging reality. And what's the reality? We are finite beings. We have limited perspective, limited knowledge, limited understanding. And no matter how right we think we are, other people standing in different places can bring us perspectives, truths, insights that we hadn't considered before. And it's foolish to suggest that I know all things. That's what the fool does. The fool already knows everything, can't be instructed, can't learn. The wise person is willing to, as Linda said, listen to other perspectives, but then think for themselves, come to their own conclusion based on what they already know to be true and what's reliable and testable. So they're open to be taught and led and they have a hunger. And so they, as the Bible says, they are lovers of truth and they recognize God is an infinite being and we're a finite being. How big is the gap? It's an infinite gap. Do we ever become an infinite God? So in all eternity future, 10 billion years in the future, how big is, we will have grown, won't we? In, into eternity, years with God, assimilate. We will have, our, our perspectives will have grown. We have much more knowledge of truth than we have now, don't, won't we? Yeah. Yes. And how big then will the gap be between us and God? Still. It's still infinite. Get your mind around. It is a ne- so the lover of truth, the wise person, is a person who loves truth and never stops advancing in it. Whereas the wicked, who were lost in the end in Thessalonians, they were not saved because they did not love the truth. It, it, doesn't, it didn't mean they didn't have correct doctrines or correct 28 fundamental beliefs that were bi- bi- biblically sound. It means their hearts didn't love truth and they couldn't grow. They couldn't learn. They were closed. That's the fool. That's what, and, and, and so the next point of this, when truth comes in, where does it have its impact? In record books no. or in the living, operating, internal soul, spirit, person, identity, character. This is design law. This is how reality works. Tim? Yes. And you may cover this, but this is one of my favorite wisdom things, and it's also in Proverbs 24 in this case. By wisdom, a house is built, and through understanding, it's established. Through knowledge, its rooms are filled with rare and beautiful treasures. (laughs) And so people I've brought here sometimes say, why are you so deep? All we need is the love of God and all that. And I said, you know, when you love truth, you want to fill your rooms with rare and beautiful treasures. Mm -hmm. Wisdom is knowing there's treasures there. Understanding is getting connected to those treasures. And uh, knowledge is just filling your internal rooms with rare and beautiful treasures that then you can share with other people. You, You expressed what people say to you. Why are you so deep? We only need God's love. Is, is it true that we need God's love? Can we be saved without God's love? No. We love because he no. first loved us. It's his love that wins us. The God, kindness of God leads us to. So, so there's no question we absolutely need God's love. And we have to be people who are converted from f- fear and selfishness to beings who love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength and neighbor as yourself. But what is the problem with having love without what Linda's talking about? Did Adam and Eve in Eden, prior to taking the fruit, love God? Yes. Did it keep them secure? No. No. And this is the problem. Love without truth is open to be deceived by lies. And lies believed, when you believe a lie about the person you love, the circle of love and trust is broken. I believe, I love you still, but I believe you're a cheat. I can't trust you anymore. Even though I still love you, I can't trust you. And if I can't trust you, I have to watch out for myself. That's selfishness. That's sin. Yeah. And so, when, so next time somebody says, why, do we just, why are you so deep? Why don't we just have the love of God? Because the love of God alone, without the truth of who God is, his trustworthiness, his method, his principle, does not secure us. We're not settled. So being sealed such that you cannot be shaken from it is being settled into the truth both intellectually and spiritually. Intellectually, understanding how reality works, understanding God's character, and spiritually that we have embraced it and we practice it in love for God and other people. So it's both. So so I'm glad you brought that up. Wisdom. 
The fruit of righteousness, this is uh, Proverbs 11.30, the fruit of righteousness is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. How does fruit come forth from any plant? By legal declaration? No. By the natural outgrowth of what it is designed to do in harmony with the laws of nature, sunshine, water, nutrition, and so forth. So the fruit of righteousness is the tree of life. What, what, what does that mean? And he who wins souls is wise. How do you win souls? How? How can you win souls? Is there, is there a process involved? Are there specific elements that are necessary to win souls? For instance, is truth, is truth necessary to win souls? Is also love necessary to win souls? And if you are a purveyor, a, a, a minister of both truth and love, does it only have its impact on the souls that are being won, or does something happen in, in you? Can you exercise truth and love without being matured and developed and, and, and bringing out even more peaceable fruits of righteousness in your own character? This is how reality works. All right. Reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing, Proverbs 12, 18. The teaching of the wise is a fountain of life, turning a man from the snares of death, Proverbs 13, 14. The path of life leads upward for the wise to keep him from going down to the grave, Proverbs 15, 24. This is a cluster. I think they're all teaching the same, same wisdom, same truth. What is, why do the words of the wise bring healing and life? Why are the teachings of the wise a fountain of life? Because they penetrate through your heart and soul. If I were to say, those who teach the laws of health are teaching life. Those are teaching truth about nutrition and exercise and, 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 uh, and, and, uh, and normal sleep hygiene. and, and all. You will, have, you will have life and better health if you do these things. Uh, does, is that like really confusing or does that make sense? Because of the laws life are built on. This is what wisdom does, teaches reality. God built it. Again, design law. He who walks with the wise grows wise, but a companion of fools suffers harm. Can you think of another Bible text that would be weighing in on the same idea? How about in 1 Corinthians 15, 53? Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Yeah. Isn't it the same as this? Society yeah. today. Yes. So what do you think if, if if Solomon or Paul wrote today, they might have something about social media yeah. corrupting good character. <laughs> Some of the things you view and imbibe. Yeah. Is there a law involved here? Beholding what By beholding, we're changed. That's exactly right. This is the law of worship and the law of exertion also. If you want something to get stronger, you must exercise. exercise it. So if you're exercising yourself to be accepted in the cool group, so you use vulgar language, you are racist or bigoted, you, you say ugly things, so this gang will accept you. You go out and do violence as an initiation right to get in. Whatever it is, the bad company wants you to you steal in order to get into the, the, the theft gang, whatever. What's happening to you? Being conformed to this world. Yeah, exactly. Conforming to the world. And you're being neurobiologically and characterologically corrupted. And this is what Paul's talking about. Again, it's not a penal legal thing. It's objective reality. What's happening? Tim, yeah. Just a point that can happen inside the churches too. You know, let me get in with this group and now they're gossiping about these people. Let me just join in and, and not make waves and that also corrupts. Thank you for that. That's exactly right. Yeah. And, and, and where are the gossips listed in scripture? In the bad column. In the bad, in the, in the naughty column. <laughs> we didn't hear that. Didn't well, he said, hear oh, but talking about you can, the same process can happen in churches when you get caught into groups and you begin to gossip and, and, uh, and, uh, and to backbite and to talk down about other church members in order to be accepted by this group in the church. Oh, do you realize they go to Tim Jennings' class? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, watch. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they don't believe in substitutionary atonement. <laughs> know what happens, so trust me. <laughs> Proverbs 20, verse 1. 
Wine is a mocker, beer is a brawler. Whoever is led astray by them is not wise. Never heard that one before, I bet. Is the Bible making a rule that if you ever ingest any substance containing any ethanol that you have committed a sin which goes into your record book that requires legal payment lest you be punished in the fires of hell for having it past the lips and gums. You might be able to taste and not swallow, I don't know. But if you ingest it, you're in trouble. Is this, is this, is this what the text is saying? No. 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 Anybody ever taken cough syrup that has alcohol in it? Most of us probably in our lifetime have somewhere along the, along the way. Uh, the Bible, many of the cough syrups are al- alcohol-based. Uh, that, that are given out there. Uh, other other med- medicinals are as well. Now, this is not setting up a rule. It's talking about reality again. Design law, laws of health. Alcoholic beverages, when consumed, can intoxicate, interfere with higher cortical function, interfere with problem solving and reasoning and discrimination and impulse control and good judgment, and if consumed repeatedly, can alter neural circuits and damage brain, cir- brain, brain tissue. And people can become physically addicted and then lose their freedom to make independent choices and begin serving the addiction to get more because they're going into withdrawal. This is what it's talking about. It's dangerous. You can hurt yourself. Can that brain function be recovered? I mean, damaged brain function from drinking? So the data shows with addictions that the brain does repair itself. I could show you some scans. I don't have them with me today. But I could show you some scans of, of brains that um, for either alcohol, uh, other substances, or combined, uh, the damage that occurs at the time that they go into treatment and where the brain function is. And then 12, 24 months later, there's, there's significant repair that happens. The brain's much improved. No question about that. It does repair. However, that does not mean the brain will be in the same place it would have been had they never used in the first place. And that's what you need to remember. Yes, the brain will repair and, and heal. No question. But, but I, it, I think the data is pretty clear. The brain never gets to the place it would have been had they been just living healthy all along. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight, Isaiah 5.21. What's being described here? Pride. Pride, okay. Not teachable. And why is it not teachable? And so, yeah, this is, this is foolishness because they close their minds off to any new learning. You know, General Patton was famous for saying, if everybody's thinking the same thing, somebody's not thinking. <laughs> It's brilliant. It's brilliant, isn't it? And good leaders don't want everybody around them to be sycophants that just feed back to them their own thoughts. They want to have, hey, here's an idea. Hey, hey, you know, I, I don't think that's going to work. Here's a problem with that. They want that challenge so they can identify problems before they actually step into the hole and, and trip and fall. The Lord says, these people come near me with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is made up only of rules taught by men. Therefore, once more, I will astound these people with wonder upon wonder. The wisdom of the wise will perish and the intelligence of the intelligent will vanish. That's Isaiah 29, 13, and 14. And then when Jesus quoted it, he quoted it this way in Mark 7, 7. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. <coughs> What's going on here? We're talking about wisdom. We're t- I'm challenged you here. Real wisdom is understanding design law and living in harmony with reality because God is the God of reality. Foolishness is creating a fantasy, what you might call a virtual reality. A reality that's not actually real. It lays as a... As a Uh, image over reality. You don't see reality anymore because you're constantly consumed with the images of the virtual world. I think of the Pharisees of Jesus' day. They thought they were wise in their own eyes. They had all these uh, rules, but a lot of them were interpretations of rules made by other Pharisees. Well, that's what he's saying right here. To them, you worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. A penal legal system of religion is fantasy. Can I say it any more clear? It's fraudulent. It is not reality. I would, anybody want to challenge me on that? Please, let's have a, a friendly, friendly, truly friendly <laughs> discussion on why that's true. If you think the angels in heaven had a list of rules uh, on stone nailed to the wall, 
Anybody think that? <laughs> they didn't know there was a law. <laughs> yes, they didn't know. Think about that. Do, do most of your kids know how to not hurt themselves by doing things that would... It won't break the law of gravity, but will take them out of harmony with the, the <laughs> principles of gravity. Your kids know not to jump off buildings, for instance. It depends on how old they are. Yeah, yeah it, it does depend on how old. That's right. The immature may not. They may, they may think in fantasy, because they saw a Superman program, they put a cape on, and kids have been known to do this, that they're going to be like Superman and jump off and fly. That's right. And that, that would be fantasy, wouldn't it? And what happens when you do fantasy in the face of reality? You get hurt. You get hurt. Yeah. Do you ever see in churches where people are getting hurt by the system and the rules? Many have walked away. Yeah, and so Jesus is saying, they, 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 so, so what's going on here in this passage we quoted, Isaiah and Mark? Aren't these people wise because they praise God and they worship God with their words and singing and go to religious meetings? They go regularly. They, they are religious in their religiosity. And they praise God and they read the Bible. But somehow they're not wise. Tim? Yeah. I want to go back to the, your previous statement that, you know, that people who keep the laws harm you, you know, when you go to church. That's my interpretation anyway. I, I didn't actually say that sentence. No, no, I can't remember exactly the way you said it. But I think that it's people who hurt you who interpret what is being taught and then turn around and aren't converted to the point where you dread taking other new people to church because you don't know how the other people are going to treat them based on the laws they have going around in their heads, their own selfishness, their lack of connection to God. I, I see that more in churches than, than just the rules themselves of the churches. I think it's the people in the churches. And yeah, but what but, but, but you're describing is the fruit of the system. You're trying to disconnect. They're not, there's no disconnection. We internalize into our hearts and minds and live out the principles that we believe and value. And so when they have a penal legal system and their righteousness is based on their performance and, and the fact that they gave up their jewelry and the fact that they gave up their whatever and then you got a new visitor come wearing jewelry... How dare you come to church or the house of God dressed in jeans or whatever it used to be in the day. Most churches are actually very accepting now of the jeans, but I remember people coming to church in jeans and they would be uh, confronted by somebody. How dare you come to the house of the Lord dressed like that? Why? Because they have a system in their mind that there are certain rules. And I think that, that, that the rules are often taught to the children in the same way parents try to teach the children the rules about not playing in the street for good reason. I don't think there's anybody trying to be malicious about it, mostly. I really do. I think most of the rules that are taught are taught from people trying to do well, but people who actually themselves don't understand objective reality and they don't understand the reason for the rules. What's the reason? And I can tell you, you might, you might figure out that I wasn't necessarily the easiest student to have in class. <laughs> And I can tell you, coming up through the system, to the religious schools that I went to, that they would have rules, and I constantly challenged my teachers. Why? What's the reason? And the answers were woefully inadequate. They were often, well, because the Bible says so. Because the red leather books say so. Because we have to have rules. Without rules, there's going to be anarchy. Well, because that's the school policy, and the school has a policy, then we, we have to keep the policy. Uh, it, it, was ne it was always just appealing to some other authority. It was never actually appealing to because it's healthy, because it's how reality works, because you'll hurt yourself if you don't. It injures you, because we love you and we want you to be the happiest, healthy person and it's to protect you. It was ne I never had that answer. Some of you went, went to the same schools I went to. Did you hear the... the, the no, I see, I see the heads. Uh, no, they, they had the same experience as me. So it wasn't my warped thinking that hurt it that way. It was really being presented that way. And that's the problem with, the, with when you have people who believe the lie about, about the law with good motive. And this, this is what breaks my heart. I've got it in the notes later. It really makes me sad to see a good-hearted person with good intentions taking an action that harms could you imagine a witch going to, as a missionary and seeing a witch doctor 
do something with their own child because they love their child and want to say that actually makes the infection worse. Isn't that sad to see? They're not trying to harm. They're bloodletting. The bloodletting, the leeching, the ble- whatever. We see a lot of this, people. So I am not judging people's motives. I don't know what their motives are. But I can, and rightly so, judge methods and principles whether they actually are harmful or healing. And that's what we're supposed to do. So I don't judge hearts when I say this, but I can tell some of these things done are absolutely harmful. And we wonder why so many younger people have left the church. Are you seeing so far in our wisdom scripture review that wisdom is living in harmony with design law? Reality, are you seeing that? Yeah. Yeah. So this is uh, Jeremiah 8.8. 8. How can you say, we are wise, for we have the law of the Lord, when actually the lying pen of the scribes has handled it falsely? Mm. 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 Reflect on that for a moment. <clears throat> who were who the scribes? These were the authorized church leaders, basically. What do you think this means? How can you say we are wise? We have the law. When the people in your organization bringing you the law are handling it falsely. Well, like the comma in today you will be with me in paradise. That's a, a scribal thing that just a mere comma changed the whole meaning and, all, and almost all Christianity goes with that change of meaning. That's a good example. Is it the only example? Does it have to actually be written by a scribe to have this problem or could it be taught by a teacher? Well, sometimes paraphrases. Um, show different things. I had somebody just asking me about something in Genesis about the sons of men with whatever. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, the daughters. And um, she was asking me about it. I said, well, I think that's a paraphrase. They were talking about angels. Right, exactly. No, this is a common belief there. And, and this is the danger when the revelation, the revealed word of God is giving generalities and people try to put in specificity that is not in the text. What about today? Uh, Do we have people claiming wisdom because they have the law or the, and that mean the, the, the 10 commandment law or the law, the Torah, the scriptures, the Bible. And because they have the Bible, the Torah, the scriptures, the 10 commandments, they claim wisdom, yet they have Romanized it. Romanized it. What's it mean to Romanize the scripture? Make it imperial, make it authoritarian, make it penal legal, make it imposed system of rules, make it uh, a, a system with, a, with an authoritarian God who oversees it like Caesar sees, oversees Rome. And if you, if you present the, the Bible in that way, are you presenting wisdom? So what is wisdom? Let's look at Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. We just read 8. eight. This is what the Lord says. Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom or the strong man boast of his strength or the rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts boast about this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. What is wisdom in this text? No, to know God. To know God. And what was Jesus' prayer in John 17, 3? Life eternal is? To know, God. to know God and Jesus Christ. And why is this wisdom? Why is that wisdom? It, it's not a trick question. Because to know God is to understand his own To know God is to know him and his design because he is the builder, the creator, who speaks things into reality and it all is created by him to operate in harmony with him. And if you know him, you know how life operates, you know how health operates, and you know what is good and you know what's not good because you know the source of good. That's wisdom. It is, is the wisdom here in Jeremiah the, uh, that we boast about knowing God and understanding God, do we obtain that wisdom by getting a degree in theology? (laughs) You you laugh at that, folks. You laugh. I want you to think functionally in our organization. What happens when a lay member has a question? Perhaps they are understanding elements of design law and they go to their pastor or conference leadership, to have a discussion. 
Are they, are they on equal footing? No. Why are they not on equal footing? Don't we all stand on equal footing before the cross? Yeah. What makes the difference? Because the pastor has letters behind his, his name. I can tell you that I have been told on multiple occasions that I'm not qualified to teach because I don't have a degree in theology. But the disciples didn't have a degree in theology. <laughs> yes, and they and, and Jesus himself, they, they, they pulled that one on him. They pulled that card out. Where did you go to school? Show me your degree. That's my point. Don't allow anybody, and, and I say this frequently in here, I'm not here to do your thinking for you. You have your own mind, your own God-given individuality, your own capacity for thinking and reasoning, and God, every person must be fully persuaded in their own mind, Romans 14, 5. We have to think these through. For the, I'm here to challenge you, to give you new ideas, new perspectives, but then it's your job to take that. Just if I was teaching algebra and I showed you some equations, it's your job to go home and work the problems and come to understand it. Yes, Linda. A little testimony here. I have a relative who came here and was the aim was to be a minister and uh, took ministerial courses and was planned to become a full-fledged minister. And then he decided to be a minister, but not as an, a minister of the Adventist Church. And now he's been out of college here for, I don't know, five, six years or something. And his co-ministerial students who did go on and become ministers, are many of them are leaving their positions. If you if you come up with can you all hear that? No, no. So she so she's saying that uh, a friend went to uh, to here here to Southern, mm -hmm. and many of the friends that went and then went to become ministers and became ministers became became employed pastors. They're leaving. They're leaving because they're they're disillusioned. They're having conversations, and my my is my relative of me uh, said that he is glad he didn't go in that direction. And we, before he went in that direction, we had a real talk about, you know, this is one job where if you change your perspective based on any new insight, and Ellen White says we will be confronted with new things throughout eternity, this is one job that if your beliefs alter at all from the dogma, then your job's on the line. You can't express, you'll notice that a lot of retired ministers come here not actual ministers come here because you know they they've been told i know ministers who were told if i see you coming here you'll lose your job can you imagine that guys wow yeah the three angels message talks about don't the chapter verse four don't four people, don't be defiled by women so explain that verse to, to said verse 14 4 revelation 14 4 says uh the righteous are not defiled by women. Okay, so in the in the in the in the metaphor, what's the virgins. be a virgin, don't be defiled by yeah. women. So what does women the women is the church, is it? No. Okay. Explain the, the women would be the prostitutes. Okay. The pure woman is the church. The pure woman okay. is the church. Yeah. The, the the impure women are those who sell themselves to up to those that are not their husband or engage in intimacies with those that are not their husband. And the intimacies are the intimacies of heart and affection. Who do you give your heart and affection to? Do you give it to Jesus Christ or do you give it to a, a false god? Or do you sell your virtue, your, your um, integrity to keep your job? Do you violate your conscience to make sure that you keep your job, you can keep your scholarship, you can, so you go along with things that you know are not right um, this is the course of method, methods of the beastly system. You can either buy or sell, save you, accept the mark. This is not some tattoo you get on your hand. It's the mark of character. Do you end up practicing methods like the world does, and you do those methods because you want the advantages the world will give you? That is selling yourself for, and that's what a prostitute does, and that's what the great harlot is in Revelation. So that's what that means. We keep ourselves pure by standing with the principles and staying loyal to our groom, which is Jesus Christ. So we, uh, Proverbs 19.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Is this speaking of terror and dread? Be terrified. Well, uh, you know, I've always said, I, I felt that this can have the, the immature and the mature meaning. It can, it can apply to both. If you're having an a orgy around a golden calf at the foot of Sinai, 
and God thunders, and it scares you enough to stop that and to start listening, wisdom has begun when you started to listen. So it can mean that. And this is, this is the, the parent who comes home and the child is having a wild party with loud music and, and alcohol and drugs. And, and, uh, and the parent comes in, turns off the stereo and raises their voice. And the child is terrified and begins to listen. If they actually listen, wisdom is beginning. So there can be a place, and you see in the Old Testament, God raises his voice and actually frightens them many times. But wisdom only begins when they listen. And sometimes when people are out of control, you have to raise their voice to get them to listen. So there's a place for that. But that's not really what it's talking about. The fear actually means awe, to revere, to, uh, to respect, to admire, to look up to. Oh, wow, he's so incredible. That, and that's when real wisdom begins. That's where we begin to want to be like him by beholding him. That's the law of worship. And we want to identify or model ourselves after him. We want to come close to him. We want to know him. And we're eager in this type of wisdom. We look up to him. Imagine if you were, I don't know, a, a young upcoming basketball player and Michael Jordan offered to coach you. <laughs> Would you be excited about that? Or it, 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 if you were a young upcoming physicist and Einstein was still alive and he'd take you on his own personal pupil, would you be excited about that? Okay? And this is the point that we admire and see God in some element of, of what he deserves. And then we are eager. We want to be his pupil or student. And another Bible word for that is? Disciple. disciple. We want to be his disciple. We want to learn from him. Sadly, too many people approach God and Jesus more like vending machines. What can I get? What can I get? What can I get? I've got my Bible promise book. And those Bible promises are, are, are metaphorical coins we can drop in the promise slot and claim my promise and get out of the vendor uh, what we have claimed in the promise. That is not wisdom. That is not coming to be eagerly taught and learn um, from, from God. So Romans 1, to 23. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. They claimed to be wise. They became fools. Is this a, well, you, the, there's a commandment. Thou shalt know the gods before me. That's the law. The law says you can't do it. They did it. They broke the law. They're in legal trouble. That's why they become fools. Is that what this is saying? What's it saying? What's it describing? By beholding. By beholding, we become change. The only outcome, we are the highest created beings on planet Earth. There is nothing on Earth that we can worship that will cause us to advance and develop. Anything we worship on Earth diminishes us, degrades us, destroys us. We become foolish. And so God, because he loves us and wants us to grow to the highest pinnacles of development, which we never actually stop through all eternity growing and developing, we worship the infinite one and we keep growing and developing. And so the commandment is not for God's need. I am God and I need you to worship me. It's for our good that he says this. And if you exchange the truth of the immortal God for anything else, you become a fool. And there's no, there's no getting around it. It is the inevitable, unavoidable consequence. Just like if you jump off the Empire State Building, you fall. This is uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 19, and then through 25. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made fool foolish the wisdom of the world? For since, the wisdom of God, for since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. What is the wisdom of this world? Describe the wisdom of this world. What does the world say? Man, that's, that's sharp. Man, you, 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 you got it going on. You're, you're wise. You ought to teach over here. What's the wisdom of the world? Survival of the fittest. The strong survive. Dominance. Control. The more you get, the, the, the more you hoard, the more you get. This is the wisdom of the world. But it's foolishness because it violates the design law. The law that God built things to operate upon. In fact, the survival of the fittest system, dominance, control, exploitation over others is actually what the Bible calls the law of sin and death. It actually is what destroys. It destroys hearts and minds who practice it. It destroys relationships. It destroys societies. It causes division. causes fighting. 
but it seems to work in a sin-infected world. When there's evil, it seems for a time that if you can get more power and more control and hoard more wealth, that you actually can advance and the, uh, over other people and protect yourself. So it seems to work in this corrupt world for a period, for a short time. But it always collapses. It doesn't work. I like what you said once about if the tree of uh, life had remained on earth, would we all have equal access to it? No, yeah, think about it. If, it was, yeah. if there really was a fountain of youth and you could drink or eat off that fruit or d- drink that liquid, do you think every human being would have access? <laughs> no. 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 Only the elite. <laughs> yes. Only the elites, which would be the people like Stalin and Hitler and those people. Continuing on with the quote, Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. A, now think that through. In, in the wisdom of the world, we look up to one who <coughs> couldn't protect himself and allowed himself to be killed. That doesn't, that's foolishness. No, we should look up to the one who can kill everybody else. A stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles, but to those whom Christ has called, both Jew and Greek, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. It's foolish to base one's security on miracles because miracles can be counterfeited. But miracles are often used because, because miracles suggest power, and power suggests dominance and control over others. And that appears to be wise in the world. If I have more power, I can control and dominate. And that's why miracles appeal. That was the whole thing behind, you know, when Jesus fed the 5,000, they wanted to try to um, lift him up and make him king. That's right. Because yep. they could see how that would be useful. And all the philosophies of the world are corrupt with this survival of its drive, power, dominance, and control. And we couldn't finish our wisdom passages without Psalms 19. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. That that verse alone describes what kind of law? If you have somebody who breaks the law of respiration by tying a plastic bag over their head and we get to them before they actually die and we simply remove the plastic bag and put them in harmony with the law, what do they do? They revive. This is design law. No legal legislated system of rules and rule enforcement can do this. Only harmony with the laws that life are built upon. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. When we understand the laws that God built reality to operate upon and live in harmony with them, we grow in wisdom. We not only get healthier, we actually get greater discernment, and we were able to identify breaches in the law, the laws of life, much more easily. We become wise in our own decision-making as we understand God's designs for life. Have you, how many of you, since you've come and look at your own personal history, where you were, and you've some appreciation of design law, you started to apply those design laws to your life. Can you look back and say, yeah, I actually see things in a much better, wiser light now. It it makes, makes wise the simple. And it wasn't that you had to study a long list of doctrinal statements. It's you've actually seen how reality works and just makes sense. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to your hearts. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to your eyes. From where does joy come? I'm going to take just a pause. Happiness and joy. I have many patients say, in fact, I had a patient this week. Dr. Jennings, I just want to be happy. I want to be happy. That's exactly right. She said it. Happiness is a byproduct. Byproducts come from doing something else. So if you want sawdust is a byproduct of woodworking. If you want sawdust, you've got to work with wood. Happiness is a byproduct of healthiness across the domains of life. If you are physically unwell, in pain, high fever, vomiting, you're not happy. If you're relationally unwell, you're in a marriage in which you're either being cheated upon or mistreated, abused, violated in some way, uh, 
or, or your, your loving spouse is uh, held as a POW and you're separated from them. Something is breaking up that relationship, you're not happy. If you're psychologically unwell, inside your head, I'm no good, I'm ugly, everybody thinks I'm stupid, I can't do anything right, you're not happy. If you're spiritually unwell, guilt, shame, worthlessness, feeling as if you're condemned by God, God doesn't really care about you, you're not happy. Happiness is a byproduct of healthiness. And if you go for happiness, if you go for it, most people end up going for pleasure-seeking. Something that makes me feel good right now, just makes me feel better right now. But most pleasure-seeking is some type of harmful behavior, spending money, getting into debt, uh, gambling, uh, eating, uh, using substances of every kind, relationships after relationship after relationship that are unhealthy, just to feel better, to feel better. That, that's not health. So I tell my patients, if you want to actually be happy, you can be happy. But don't ask, what can I do to be happy? Ask, what can I, where in my life am I not healthy? And what do I need to do to become healthy? Across the domains. And the byproduct, happiness always comes. Now, that's happiness. What about joy? Because this is the, the joy. Joy comes from living out and fulfilling God's purposes in your life. A musician gets joy playing and composing music. An artist gets joy at producing art. A chemist gets joy uh, doing chemistry. A mathematician gets joy solving problems, filling the purposes that God has called. And one of the purposes he's called for all of us is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and neighbor as yourself. And as we live love, the consequence of that for us is joy. Joy is the byproduct from living out the purposes of God. Okay. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever, Oh, wait, did, 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 yeah, I did that, okay. The ordinances of the Lord are sure, altogether righteous. The more precious than gold, more precious, they are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. By them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Why are God's ordinances, laws, precepts sweet? And why is there great reward in keeping them? for they're just the protocols. It's like the laws of health. When you understand them, there is great reward and joy in living in harmony with them. I can tell you, I feel better when I exercise regularly. I feel better when I get adequate regular sleep. Amen. Amen. This, isn't, this isn't artificial. It's actually physiological and real. I also feel better when I'm at peace with my wife. Yeah. <laughs> Which... Fortunately, because she is so gracious, it's almost always the case. <laughs> you know, you have to be very special to put up with me. So. <laughs> but that's how wisdom works. It understands and seeks to, to choose to live in harmony with the, the laws that God built life to operate upon. Okay, we just finished Sabbath's lesson. We have about seven minutes to go. But... <laughs> And there's a lot of really good stuff in the lesson. I think we might go over a minute or two today. Sunday's lesson, it says, uh, first paragraph, it says, Paul urges the believers in Ephesus to walk in love, a call important to this section. The walking, this walking in love is the, to be modeled after Christ's own love for us, expressed in his atoning sacrifice. Paul affirms four things about that sacrifice. It is motivated by both the love of God and the Father and Christ himself, it is substitutionary with Christ dying in our place. Christ is no passive victim, but gave himself up for us. Under the Im imagery of the Old Testament sanctuary service, Christ's death is also a sacrifice which is made to God. And the sacrifice is accepted by God since it is a fragrant offering. Any concerns about this at all? Anybody have any... Um, Wait a minute moments there. <laughs> let, me, let me question this. Let me reason through this. First, let's affirm the truths in the statements. And this is, this is where I find this so sad. I, I, I just want to say, I'm sure the people who wrote this believe in their heart of hearts they're doing the, will of, the work and the will of God. I don't think there's anything nefarious here. I don't think these people are malicious. I don't think they're doing anything to try to do any harm at all. It'd be like a little girl who is told by the father that she trusts a lie, and she passes that lie on to mom. She's not trying to deceive mom. She's trying to be a good little girl 
and tell mommy what daddy said. And so I don't, I, I, but, but, but even though the little girl is sincere and doing her best, the information is still false. And we have to make that distinction here. So let's affirm what's true. God is love, and God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are love, and they love us. And Jesus, and, and, and they all three are in the process of saving us together. Yeah. If God is for us, who, you know, who, who is against us? Who did not spare his son? So forth. Jesus became a real human being, lived a sinless life, became the second Adam. And as it says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. There's substitution. We believe in substitution. But for the biblical reason, so that we might be declared, even though we're not, to be... No. no. That's not biblical. That's fantasy. So that we might become the righteousness of God. Amen. We believe in that. So Jesus became our substitute so that we might become the righteousness of God. And by, res and by restoring us to righteousness, we are brought back into unity. As, as we're restored back into righteousness, we are reconciled or brought back into unity with God called at one or atonement. But the lesson then reveals how it has accepted the lie about God's law and has Romanized the gospel to make it penal legal rather than healing and restorative. And it misrepresents God and creates an artifact, a false pagan concept of one member of the Godhead having to be offered something from someone else in order for salvation to occur. Jesus has to present his offering to the Father and it says, Christ's death is also a sacrifice which is made to God. The sacrifice accepted by God as a fragrant offering. And they reference Ephesians 5.2. So let's read these verses. Well, let's read this verse. And I'm going to read it in several translations. And I'm doing this because it's an excellent exercise. When we talk about the scribes that handle it falsely, it's an excellent exercise right here to show you. And, and I want to say this, what I said about the lesson, I want to say about the translators. I'm convinced that the translators, in all innocence, uh, with, with every good motive, doing the best that they know how, are bringing legitimate words across that are legitimate translation options. However, they translate with a bias. And the bias they translate is God's law works like human law. They've accepted the Roman law. And therefore, when there's an option to bring across a legal-sounding interpretation that is linguistically legitimate, they choose it when the text itself is actually meaning something else. I'm going to show that to you right now. So here are three different versions of Ephesians 5.2. First is the NIV. Light, uh, live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Or the New English translation also says a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. And the New King James Version says an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. So these three have this same idea that the authors would say, see, the offering is offered to God. Now I want you to look at two alternate versions. This is the Good News and the New Living, which are also legitimate translations. Your life must be controlled by love, just as Christ loved us and gave his life for us as a sweet-smelling offering and sacrifice that pleases God. And then the New Living says, um, and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. Now understand, a pleasing aroma to God is not something that's offered to God. If you happen to smell, oh man, look at, smell, smell the gardenias. Oh, I love the smell of those gardenias. Are the gardenias being offered to you? Is it because you pl you're pleased by the aroma of them? No. Okay, so God is pleased by the aroma. We're going to get to that in a minute. And he's pleased by what Christ has accomplished and achieved. The sacrifice of Christ pleases him. But that is not the same thing as the sacrifice being offered to God at all. God was pleased because Christ accomplished the mission that God sent him to accomplish. And what did the sinless life and substitutionary death of Christ accomplish? Accomplish. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity that by his death he might destroy, by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery 
by their fear of death. So one thing he accomplished, destroy the devil and his power and the power of death and free us. He also, 2 Timothy 1.10, Christ Jesus who has destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. He came to destroy death itself. And 1 John 3.8, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. And the devil has worked to efface the image of God in man and make us be image bearers of Satan. That's his work. To make us demonic in character and nature. And Christ defeated his work by perfectly restoring the image of God in this species human, in his own humanity. So Jesus came to earth to destroy Satan, Satan's power, death, Satan's work, and free humans from the slavery to fear, selfishness, sin, and death. And who sent Jesus to accomplish this mission? This was his mission. He accomplished it. Who sent him to do it? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And God was, in, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ not counting men's sins against him, 2 Corinthians 5.19. God was reconciling. Christ was the agent of the Godhead to accomplish the mission the Father wanted accomplished. There's a verse somewhere that says, um, it pleased God to crush, to crush Jesus. So God was pleased with Jesus because Jesus accomplished the purpose, God's will, God's desire, God's goal to destroy sin and Satan and death and restore humanity back to perfect, perfection and unity with him. Nothing is being done to God, hold, nothing is being done to God or paid to God or offered as a sacrifice to God. But what is being presented to God, now I want you to hear, what is being presented to God is the victory, the success, with its results, the redeemed who are cleansed and perfected. And this pleases God very much. He's very pleased that Christ succeeded. He's very pleased that sin has been destroyed, that death has been destroyed, that Satan has been destroyed. And he's very pleased that humanity has been saved. This is what, so the victory and the accomplishment is presented as the completed work. Father, I have finished the work you have given me to do. John 17. And that's design law. That's objective reality. Yeah. Um, I got to finish this point. Okay, seriously. It's about the aroma. The aroma. Can't leave that hanging. In the Old Testament sacrificial ser service, the aroma of the burnt offering is said to be pleasing to God. Why? Well, that old system is theater. It's not reality. God didn't like simply the smell of burnt flesh. It's theatrical. And what does it symbolize? It symbolized the burning out and the eradication and the destruction of sin. That's what it symbolized, the curing, the healing, the saving. It would be like a physician father using a radiation knife to burn cancer out of their child and save the child. And they would be very pleased to know all the cancer is burned out. And that's why oh, the aroma represents the destruction of sin, not the destruction of the sinner. It's the old man that dies and the new man rises to life. That's what's being symbolized. And that's why that aroma is pleasing because we have died to the old and we rise to the new. Now there are several comments. Yes, yes. Go ahead. Um, I'm no theo, theo, theologian. theologian. Okay. And when I come across these te texts, that's what it sounds like. God made the sacrifice to God. And, and it I, sounds that way because you're reading it in an English translation in which the translator believed that's what it was and wrote it to sound that way. It's not that way in the so Greek. How? I don't know Greek and I don't know... And neither do I. No, that's why I use lexicons, and that's why I use a wide variety of translations. When you read something like that, you don't have to actually know the Greek in, with the number of translations today. You notice what I did? I didn't go to the Greek. I went to other translations. And then if, if I still didn't like the translation, for instance, there's a place where it says, um, 
I don't remember the text off the top of my head, the verse, but uh, Jesus said, I, when I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. <laughs> Every translation puts the word men in there. It's not there. That's added. You would have to get that knowledge from somewhere. But it doesn't fit with Colossians 1.18, which says that, that um, all things in heaven and earth are reconciled to Christ at the cross. So it's not just men that are being reconciled. And so, so even if you don't know the language, you compare Scripture with Scripture, and you have to understand all 66, and there has to be total perfect harmony amongst them all. And so if you have things that don't sound like they're saying the same thing, one possibility is there's a translation problem. One possibility is we're not understanding it contextually. There's a lot of possibilities, but when we understand the design law principles, we can know certain things. Classic one would be this idea of Jesus pleading to his father. Do we take the dark speech? Do you know what I mean by dark speech? Jesus said, it says in the Bible to, to prophets, I, I speak in dark speech and riddles and dreams, but Moses, I speak face to face as a man speaks to his friend. So God, the Bible says that God will often speak to his prophets in dreams and in riddles and parables and dark speech and metaphors, symbols and similes, all these types of things. And we see this all through scripture. So you see in Revelation and Daniel, you see all types of imagery that is symbolic in nature. But then we also find in scripture plain statements. In John 16, 26, Jesus says to his disciples, I've been speaking to you in metaphors and similes and, 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 and parables and figures of speech. Now I'm going to tell you plainly about my father. And after he finishes what he says in John 16, 26, the disciple says, so we have Jesus' statement, it's plain talk. We have the disciples' response. Now you're telling us plainly like it is. No more symbols, no more, no more metaphors. And Jesus says, I will not pray the father for you because the father himself loves you. That's the plain truth of scripture, John 16, 26. Okay? And so all these other texts have to be reconciled with that one as well, the plain one. And what happens is because there's an assumption in the translation of the law, then you get these things like this, but it was very pleasing to God. And then you were referencing a text in Isaiah. Yeah, 53. I looked it up. 53.10. Mm -hmm. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. Yeah, that's a translation issue. Check several other translations. That, that's a translation issue. The Lord didn't crush him. So one of the other ones will be something, that the Lord is pleased that he was crushed, or the Lord is, uh, so I don't have all my translations. Uh, and then this is the, what was it, the authorized King James Version says, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. And you have to read all of Isaiah 53. And in Isaiah 53, it will say that he took upon himself our iniquities, our infirmities. Yet we esteemed him, smitten by God and stricken by him. And so if you read the whole context, we were gonna th he took upon himself our condition. And in doing so, uh, he was bruised for that. So it pleased God to allow him to withdraw his presence to let go and not protect him anymore and allow him to be bruised for the purpose of accomplishing the goal of fixing the problem. Yet we would misunderstand and we would actually think God was the one doing it to him because we think through human law. And so there's no conflict there if you actually understand the methods and, uh, and the way God accomplishes things. Yes? Uh, going back to Ephesians, um, I was looking at a lexicon this morning and one of the ways that that verse could be translated in that section is that Christ gave himself up as a gift and a sacrifice, God's fragrant aroma to us. Yes, okay, I like that too. Well, we're not going to get through any more in the last, some really, some other fun stuff in the lesson on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. <laughs> but we've really run out of time here. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and close with prayer. Yeah, just check out the notes. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your love for your mercy, for the, for the way you have created your universe to operate. We thank you for the Sabbath, which is your weekly sign built into time that you rest from using power and don't use power to force us in line, but leave us free. Amen. We are so thankful that you are all powerful and all truth and all love, and you give us real freedom. We pray that we can internalize these principles into our own hearts and minds, live the life that you've designed for us to live, to live these methods out in how we treat others, we pray, and that you will come soon in your holy name. Amen. Amen. So a short break, and then we do our Q&A time, and then we'll have Pablo. 